Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I hope this chapter goes really well, and I want to thank the guest speakers for coming and being able, or you know, being willing to do this. Um, let's just uh, start off with prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this time that we have to come together and worship you and learn about you and praise you, God. Uh, thank you for all this, all this that you've done for us, and I pray that uh, it's a good 45 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.
Thank you so much, Schrader family. That was awesome. It was so good to sing together, um, together but apart. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And now I would like to introduce our guest speakers. They are Martin and Mariela. Some of you might recognize them from high school retreat two years ago, something like that. And they are here to help us answer the answer the question why should we even believe the bible right we're doing a series about the bible a book of answers and so they're going to help us think through and realize why we can trust the bible and why we can count on the bible to help us answer life's big questions so without further ado i'll hand it over to martin and mariella Uh, hello, what's up? Uh, I hope you can hear me properly. Uh, please excuse my accent. This is what happens when you learn English, uh, basically watching stand-up comedy. And uh, uh, forgive my haircut or maybe my lack of a haircut. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm too much of a coward to shave myself. So uh, let me present. I have a, a PowerPoint. I don't know if I can present it. Yeah, cool. Can you see it? Somebody can affirm? Yeah, we can please? see it. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I want to speak right now about um, something that was an itch for me. You know, when I became a Christian, um, I still had obviously lots of doubts. And one of them was, why should I even trust the Bible, right? Because, you know, you can find like really normal stuff, you know, in uh, history and, and um, different, um, I don't know, histories about kings and things that seem normal. But you also found like really weird stories, right? Uh, especially if you look into some more uh, apocalyptic books, let's say, right? And I also found lots of miracles. And I was dumbfounded when I uh, realized this stuff was inside the Bible. So the thing is, can we trust the Bible is, or at least the way I approached this question was, well, the Bible makes historical claims. You know, it states that, for example, Jesus Christ uh, was born, that he preached, that he died by crucifixion, he was raised from the dead. So how do I know that this actually happened, right? Because if it actually happened, then it makes a difference. But how do you know that? And the more, let's say, a scholarly way to uh, phrase this question is, how do you know the Bible is historic, historically reliable, right? So today I will present you three tests because you have to test the text right and these three tests are the, as follows the hon honesty test basically uh, are the authors of the bible um being honest you know uh, it's not exactly if they are telling the truth it's more like are they trying to tell the truth or are they lying are they making a story up or uh, are they like actually trying to tell something that is true you know something that they believe to be true then the telephone test why because the bible was written like about two thousand years ago some parts even more three thousand four thousand years ago so how do you know that the bible hasn't changed with time you know 
maybe some monk make made an error, you know, in the fifth century, and now we all drink wine in Sundays. I don't know. Or maybe, I don't know, some people say that Constantine, for example, an, an emperor, fabric fabricated Christianity on the third century. Is this true? How, how do you know that, right? And that corroboration test, um, is there any external evidence to the Bible that corroborates their claims? Is there any way to know that what's inside the Bible is actually true? So, honestly, um, something that really uh, struck me when I first began to read the Bible was how the authors, the authors of the New Testament uh, presented the, the information, right? For example, Luke. Luke says as follows, many had undertaken to draw up an account of the things that had been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account. So the thing is, when you invent, uh, sorry, when you intend uh, to tell a story, how do you say it, right? How do you like begin? Well, Luke first began by stating clearly his intention. His intention was to chronicle history. Yeah, maybe he wasn't an eyewitness, but he interviewed eyewitnesses. He researched, he investigated, does he sound like someone who intends to be honest? What about the others? Like, for example, Peter. Peter was one of the main, uh, was the main apostle, actually. And he says, For we did not follow cleverly designed stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, right? And John, for example, that's, um, uh, he was the youngest of the apostles. He was maybe about your age, probably, when he was around Jesus. And years later, when he's uh, telling these events uh, to another church, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes and our hands have touched, this we proclaim. How many senses does John mention? Well, three, you know. You, he's like saying, man, I heard him, I saw him, and I touched him. It's real, right? So... I'm not saying I'm not saying that these uh, passages in the Bible prove that the Bible is true. I am saying that this at least shows that the authors of the Bible pretended like they, they tried to be honest. You know, they were trying to to chronicle history. They were not like inventing a story. They they were actually like uh, purposely saying that you know this is something I lived, I saw, I touched. I interviewed people that told me this stuff. This is real, you know, that's their, their intention. Now, uh, is there any actual evidence that they cared about truth? You know, maybe they made this up. And this is also something that was very confusing for me. You know, most times when we read the Bible, we normally like um, read very quickly over many details. And well, some, some weeks ago, I was uh, beginning a, a study of, of the Gospel of Luke. And it's very particular how he describes different ev events in the Bible, right? Different events in history, to be more precise. For example, the beginning of John's ministry, John the Baptist. Um, he gives a description, you know, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Pontius. I'm not going to read it all, but basically he gives a lot of details, lots of them. Like he, he pinpoints who's the emperor, who's the governor, who's the tetrarch or the, not even the, the, the country they are, but actually other uh, neighbor countries, who's the high priest. And because of the data that, looks, that Luke gave us, we know the exact date John the Baptist began his ministry, or at least the exact year, you know, we, we know it's the 26th year. So... The, the authors of the New Testament say they care about truth, they provide us eyewitness testimony, 
and even gave us accurate historical reference, references so that we can know where and when things happened. Another point, okay? Let's say, for example, um, you know, Mr. Fry asks you, why didn't you bring your homework? Well, you won't like tell the truth normally, right? You won't say you spent all night watching Netflix or uh, playing Fall Guys or whatever. You will say something else. You will say, well, I was taking care of my grandmother. I was with my aunt in, one, in my aunt's birthday. I was rescuing puppies. I don't know, whatever. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because we don't want to be punished, right? We usually lie to avoid getting punished. And when we lie, uh, we lie in order to like uh, be good, you know? We, we don't want to be seen as bad by other people, right? So this is something very important because now the following question is, um, are the authors of the New Testament lying? Well, as I said before, when somebody lies, usually they don't like say embarrassing stuff, right? You don't say, I was watching Netflix. You say, I was rescuing children in the street or whatever. I don't know. You lie in order to like uh, be seen as good. So, again, are the authors of the New Testament lying? Is there anything embarrassing that the authors shouldn't be including? Well, we see very embarrassing stuff in the Bible. You know, Peter, the main apostle, denied Christ three times, once to a little girl. That's embarrassing. The disciples didn't understand the teachings of Jesus. They were too dumb to get it. And Jesus was using parables. You know, there's actually a passage in which like Jesus is explaining things in a parable and the uh, disciples approach him and say, you know, Jesus, I don't get it. And Jesus responds, well, if you don't get this basic stuff, how do you plan to get the more complicated stuff? You know, so quite embarrassing. We also see, for example, that the apostles fall asleep in Gethsemane. Jesus told them three times not to fall asleep while they were praying and they did Anyways, that's embarrassing. Uh, for example, there's another occasion. Jesus calls Peter Satan. Now, this is not like just merely name calling. This is very serious stuff. Uh, nonetheless, it's in the Bible. They put it. And finally, the woman found the empty tomb of Jesus. And this is something very embarrassing for the time. Maybe not, uh, you know, in the 21st century, but... Um, in the first century, you know, in the time of Jesus, um, female testimony was not deemed uh, valuable. Let's say, for example, in a trial, if you have only if you had only like um, uh, female eyewitnesses, uh, your case was weak. It was considered uh, not worth like looking up, look, looking it up. You know. Nonetheless, this stuff is in the Bible, so. What this shows us is that the authors of the Bible cared about truth. They cared about truth enough to include things that would be embarrassing, even though they could lie about it, you know, like cover it up. They didn't. And finally, how do we know that they are being honest? Well, again, why do you lie? Normally, you lie to avoid getting punished. Nobody lies in order to get punished. Nonetheless, uh, this is what we see with the disciples, with the apostles, with the authors of the New Testament. All of them, without an exception, died horribly. Uh, most of them were persecuted their whole lives. Most of them died uh, by getting stoned to death. Um, one of them was crucified upside down. Uh, there are stories about some of them getting boiled alive. That's that's horrible. One of them maybe was skinned alive. That's also horrible. And the thing is, why would you lie about stuff that is going to get you killed? That makes no sense, you know? But they were willing to die for what they preached and wrote. Now, again, this doesn't prove that the stories are true, but it shows that they were being honest right? 
Then the telephone test. How do we know that the dex hasn't changed with time? Well, uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, but basically uh, the question is how much time has passed between the originals and the earliest copies we have? Because, you know, if there's like too much time between them, maybe like somebody made an error in between like copying the manuscript and now like you have a bad copy. So how do you know uh, how, uh, how good are the copies? Well, the easiest way to know it is how, how much time has passed between the original and the earliest manuscript or the earliest uh, copies. So let's see uh, a point of reference, like um, secular ancient texts. We have the Aeneid by Virgil, uh, Naturalis Historia by Pliny the Elder, that's an encyclopedia of antiquity, and Josephus, who is, uh, he was a very important um, historian of his age, let's say. So how much of a time gap is there between the originals and the copies? Well, for most of them, around 400 years. For Josephus, around 800. That's, that's a lot, but that's actually very good for history. You know, in the field of history, you, you usually manage uh, time gaps uh, in, in the centuries, you know. What about the Bible? Well, for the Bible, uh, most of the books are about 100 years. 100 years between the original and the copy. For the whole Bible, around 200. Now, this may seem like a lot, but it's important to understand the point of reference. These are the best attested, most known works of antiquity. And there's a 400 years of uh, long time gap, let's say. For the Bible, it's around 100. That's way too good. And if you don't believe me, the, these are pictures of the manuscripts. You can find them. This is a piece of Luke and the other one is a piece of John. Uh, actually, the piece of John is very interesting because it may be a direct copy of the original manuscript. That's is crazy when you think about it. Uh, Daniel B. Wallace says that we have more and early manuscript evidence about the person of Jesus Christ than we do for anyone else in ancient world, including Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. Now, how many copies do we have, you know, of the Bible? This is important because more copies usually mean more differences, but this also means that it is easier to reconstruct the originals, right? So how many are they? Well, again, a point of reference. The Iliad by Homer that you may have already read uh, is one of the most famous works of antiquity. It has around 800, um, excuse me, 1800 copies, you know, uh, 1,800. It's, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's enough. What about uh, Pla Plato's? Well, he has around 250. And for the rest, around 200, and Augustus Caesar, only 10. Not that much, you know. What about the Bible? Well, in Greek, we have about 5,800. In Latin, we have about 10,000. In other languages, we have about 9,000. And even if, even if we lost all other copies, we have around 1 million quotes by early Christians. You know, 1 million quotes of the Bible. We could reconstruct the whole Bible using only quotes from early Christians. So, uh, in conclusion, you know, the Bible is the document with the most and earliest amount of copies in antiquity. It passes the telephone test better than any other work of antiquity. And finally, the corroboration test. I'm not gonna spend uh, like too much time in this. Uh, basically, let's see uh, other historians, other authors in those times that could corroborate the things that are written in the New Testament. So we have several. We have the, the main that are Josephus, he's Jewish, Pliny the Young, who is Roman, Tacitus, he's a Roman uh, historian, and Lucian of Samosata, who is a, a pagan author. Uh, and well, there are also Christians like St. Clement of Rome and others, but that would be too easy, right? Because they're Christians, of course they will corroborate the Bible. But let's focus on the, on the more hard, let's say, 
on the hard ones, you know, the, the, the pagan, the, the Jewish, the Roman. What do they say about Jesus? Well, Josephus says that Jesus lived in Jerusalem. He had lots of Jewish and Gentile disciples, that means uh, Greek. He was crucified by Pontius Pilate. His disciples thought that he was the Messiah. They reported that he was a miracle worker and that he had appeared to them alive three days after he, his crucifixion. They also say that, uh, Josephus also say that uh, Jesus had a brother called James and that Jesus called himself Christ. No, that's, that's a lot of corroboration. What about Pliny the Young? Pliny the Young was actually, by the way, he was a, a, a Roman authority who was torturing Christians. And he wrote a letter asking for advice because these Christians were too stubborn to abandon their faith. That was actually what happened. And he says as follows, that Christians were persecuted by the Romans, that again, Jesus was worshipped as God. Usually Christians preferred to die before abandoning their faith. And that Christians met on Sunday to sing and worship, and they believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that, well, Christ. Uh, the Christian faith had um, experienced a rapid expansion. It actually like reached Rome very quickly. And finally, Tacitus. Tacitus is also a very interesting case because Tacitus was a, a Roman historian and a priest, a, pa a pagan priest who professionally uh, researched pagan, no, well, not pagan, he, he professionally researched foreign religions to assess if they were like um, a, a danger for the for the empire, that was his job. <laughs> That's that was his living, you know, researching foreign religions. And he said that Jesus founded Christianity, uh, where he lived in Judea. That Jesus was killed by Pontius Pilate, and that Christianism Christianism expanded to Rome again. And finally, Lucian of Samosata is a very weird case because he's actually making fun of Christians when he says this stuff. Again, he says that Jesus was crucified in Palestine, that uh, he had a lot of worshippers who were like pagan and stuff, and that Jesus conv convinced Christians they were all brothers to the point they shared their wealth and goods, and usually Christian belief in eternal life to the point of being fearless of death. This was all written by someone making fun of Christians right, in, the time, in those times. So, my point, what is my point? Uh, my point is that the Bible makes lots of claims. Um, most of them historical claims, you know. Um, the Bible makes the claim that Jesus Christ actually was born, he preached, died, uh, and, was and was raised from the dead. Is this something important? You know, is it important to ponder if this actually happened? Uh, I believe so. Uh, actually, Paul, one of the main figures in Christianity, said that if if Christ has not been raised, then, well, uh, the whole Christian faith is pointless. And I agree with him, you know. I, I became a Christian, obviously not because I was convinced by evidence. I have a, a different experience in my life that led me to Christianity. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I began to... to question myself about this and, and began to wonder uh, I, I, I wanted to know because if my faith is false I am wasting my, my life I am wasting my time even if it makes me happy or whatever um, I am throwing away my life you know so I, I, I really wanted to know if, if, if it is true that, that Christ really was raised from the dead now, the evidence points that the Bible is actually a, a really uh, historically reliable book. And this began to, to really shake my, my way of seeing the Bible because I, I usually, I used to see it when I was uh, younger, let's say, as a collection of histories that have like, uh, I don't know, moral teachings, stuff like that, you know. Uh, but I began to realize that it was actually things that really happened. Now, uh, I used to work uh, a year ago, some years ago, with cancer patients. I, I'm a psychologist. I used to work with cancer patients. Uh, some of them were, you know, the age of my grandfathers. Some of them were the age of, I know, my fathers. 
but some of them were my age, uh, some of them were your age. And um, I, I, I began to have conversations with them and, and began to realize that, you know, maybe for people in, the, in their like uh, everyday, it's not that relevant, you know, because people don't like ponder about their life and death and the meaning of life or whatever, usually, you know, but for these patients who were really struggling with really difficult uh, situations, uh, this reality, you know, the reality of the, of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ began to be uh, really relevant. And this is when I began to, to realize if Jesus really died and rose from the dead, what does that mean for my life? I, I, have spoke, I have spoken with several families, Christian families, who clung to the bodies of their dead loved ones and afterwards approached me with joy, with, with hope, knowing that they will be reunited eventually. Uh, I believe that Christian faith uh, is historically reliable and historically founded. It's not something that was made up some years ago, you know, but somebody trying to manipulate culture or whatever. So I challenge you, think about this stuff. Think about uh, what difference does this make in your life? And if you are not like uh, convinced by the evidence that I have presented, okay, uh, research, uh, do, do your research. And I am 100% certain that you will arrive at the same conclusion as I did. So, well, thank you. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, Chris? Yeah, thank you so much, Martin. That was awesome, and I fully agree. If you are doubting, if you are not 100% sure, or you're, like, really sure that Christianity is not true, which other way you go on that, do the research, do the investigation. Um, Martin yeah, I mean, gave us I really want to add something. Yeah, go for yeah. it. You know, if it turns out that it's false, I would want to know. <laughs> I mean, I, I would really want to know because I'm investing a lot of time in my, Christian, in, my, in my Christian life. So if it is false, I will really want to know. So trust me, I have researched this stuff and I encourage you to research it too. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I had no, to add no, that's great. That's great. And yeah, and so Martin and I, we know each other. We've talked about, you know, our experiences and how we've had doubts before. The worst thing you could do with a doubt is to let it sit there, right? To yeah. let it sit in your heart. You need to actually go and talk to people, talk to your teachers, talk to pastors. Um, um, in a bit, I'm going to have Martin and Mariela tell you about their organization and, you know, the resources that they have and actually go and look and investigate and pray about it too. And I'm pretty sure you'll find the same answers that we did. Just don't let your doubts just sit there. Actually go and look for the answers. And speaking of answers, uh, Martin and Mariela, they work for an organization called um, Arzim Latam, which stands for Ravi Zacharias, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries of Latin America. Is that, that's pretty much it, right? Uh, that's about it, yeah. yeah. And um, one of the things that, that they do is whenever they go and they speak, they have a, a question and response or a question and answer time. And so now is the time where you guys can go and ask them questions. It could be pretty much about anything biblical, right? Um, whatever questions you have, it could be about the message, it could be about other parts of the Bible, and they have been trained to... If they don't know the answer, help us get set up so that we can look for it later. But these guys are pretty smart, and they do have a decent amount of answers. So you can, you can either unmute yourself, or you can put it in the comments, and we'll go through as many as we have time for. So as we're waiting, Martin, can you tell us a little bit more about the, about uh, Arzim? Yeah, sure. Um, so RZIM was found by uh, Ravi Zacharias. He, he's, he was, he, he passed away some, 
some months ago. Uh, he was an uh, uh, Indian speaker, you know, Indian th Christian theologian. He uh, moved to Canada, he began the ministry there, and he, he was very awesome. Uh, really great guy. I, I had the pleasure to meet him. And the ministry has been in Peru for the last four years. We usually go around schools, colleges, uh, universities, and all, I don't know, everywhere we are invited to answer questions. That's our mission. We know we believe that the, the Christian faith is uh, reasonable. We believe it has answers to questions. And we believe that normally, you know, people have questions and they are not encouraged to make them in church. So we really love to have conversations and answer answer them. That's basically what we do. Yeah.